Um, so, so with this, I think that um, if I were doing this problem, if I were kind of looking at part A on this one, um, what I would look to do on this is, is like if I read the read part A on here, um, anytime it starts to talk about things like justify if there's at least one time value suddenly i instantly think that's either a mean value theorem or an intermediate value theorem and then when they talk about the derivative and i'm given the just v i know instantly right there that i know that this is going to be a mean value theorem question because they're asking me to um to differentiate this table but explain why there must be one equal to zero. So I know that, wow, that, that's got to be a mean value theorem question because that's what the mean value theorem says. Remember, the mean value theorem is the one that says, um, says that f prime of some value is equal to f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. That's what the mean value theorem says. If the function is continuous and differentiable. So if the function is continuous and differentiable, that's what exists in the mean value theorem. So I think that right away I would go, wow, that's exactly what they're asking on this. And that's sure enough what they what they were asking. So um, sticking to the to the strict um, interval that they were that they asked me about, which was um, 0.3 to 2.8, that's the interval that I'm going to use is here to here. And so suddenly I know that I would I would say something along the lines of V prime of P of T is roughly equal to um I do 55 minus 55 divided by 2.8 minus 0.3, which is equal to zero. And then I would say, so So I just pulled the values that they, that they were looking at right from the table because that's where they kind of asked me to kind of hone in on those values. And then I would say, you know, the P of T is differentiable. Um, so it is also continuous. I don't think you'd need the idea that it's continuous, but because it's differentiable by the mean value theorem, there is one value, and it's maybe at least one value between 0.3 and 2.8 where v prime um, of t is going to equal zero. And then I'd be done with that. But I, I, so the work that they want me, really the key pieces of work that they would want me to have is they'd want me to have the mean value theorem, they'd want me to have that this thing is differentiable, and they'd want me to have that. I think if I have those three green highlighted things, then then um, then I, I'm good. Then, I, then I've justified exactly what they wanted. If they said, does the data support it, I then would need to say, yes, the data does support it. But that's, that's what I would do on that. Any questions on that? Yeah, I have a question, Mr. Alquist. Yeah. Um, why why do we need that that top part that's highlighted the the um the arith arithmetic stuff? Because doesn't if you just say by MVT there's at least one point that equals zero, wouldn't that be kind of re redundant at the top? Because you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, so so one of the one of the issues is um, the mean value theorem just guarantees that there's that there's that that this stuff is true. And so unless we show this equation in the context of our problem, 
it could be really generic. And, 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 you know, if, if that didn't happen to go from 55 to 55 for the, for the velocity, um, then we wouldn't be able to say that, that it, that it happens. Um, so the only reason it happens is the velocity goes from 55 to 55 again. So generally what they're trying to do is, is to kind of have you merge the idea of the mean value theorem and the context of this specific problem. So pulling values from their table is really important. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Right. Any other I have a question too. Yeah. Um, so when I was doing this, I kind of like forgot that the mean value theorem existed. So I like took the derivative, or I like calculated the derivative of like 0 0.3 and of 2.8 and then I said like through the intermediate value theorem, would that be, um, would I like get points for that? I understand what you're doing and that, and that makes some, some sense. I think that, um, the, the problem is, is when you go outside of kind of the guidelines of what they're trying to do, they would really, be really nitpicky and because you're I mean I don't think it's a necessarily a flawed argument but I I would have a hard time seeing a complete argument and so they would be really um, I, I don't think that you'd get credit for that um, because they would because there are holes that you could poke in it because truly in order to use to find um, the derivative at 0.3 and the derivative at 2.8, you would need an equation and then you'd need to be able to plug it in. So any any derivative that you're doing is sort of an, uh, is an estimation. And, and, and so that's where it becomes a little bit flawed. Although I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a pretty good practice to say, wow, you know, at, at 0.3, it looks like, because, because you really don't know what the actual value of, P prime of 0.3 is, and that and that's where he, that's where it becomes a little bit flawed. Okay. Any other questions on this part? All right. Um, I'm gonna run out of room. So what I'm gonna do? Well, hopefully, if you're if you're taking notes by phone, you probably or I mean later on, you can um, you can pause the video and copy this down because I'm going to erase it now. So, um, but there is a answer key, so you could find it that way too. Um, cause I'm going to use the same space so I don't have to cut and paste this one. Um, so, on the second part on this, it's asking for me to do something with the trapezoidal rule. And for sure that if you have a table like that, I can almost guarantee that they're going to ask you to do something with the trapezoidal rule or the Riemann sum. Um, so first of all, you know, you're going to have to have a trapezoidal sum, which means that, um, you know, on the in your notes on the day of the test, you probably ought to have that idea that a trapezoid is found, that the area of a trapezoid is found by that and with our height here and our base one here and our base two here, just so that you know that that's, that's what you're gonna end up using. And then this particular one kind of says, okay, even, even more so um, use these three specific um spaces and then we're going to approximate this integral so when you think about like what we're doing we're doing from here to here that would be one trapezoid from here to here is another trapezoid and from here to here is another trapezoid and um since i've kind of been saying don't simplify you guys have done a really really good job of of, of kind of honing in on that and saying i'm not going to simplify uh, to the point where you even don't simplify some things that I, that I would, but 
I'm not going to simplify anything on here, but what I would do is I would do, um, you know, if it were me on the exam, because I'd want to be complete, I'd probably, although you wouldn't need to have the integral from 0 to 2.8 of v p of t uh, dt is approximately, I mean, you wouldn't need to have that piece. You could just probably jump right into it. But, I mean, I don't think that that's a bad thing to just sort of um, clarify that that's what you're you're writing down. And then I would do, you know, the first trapezoid is one half, and then I would do 0.3 minus zero. Now, I know that you wouldn't necessarily have to write that either, but um, but it, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't hurt because, it boy, it shows you exactly what you have. So there's the first trapezoid. That's the trapezoid from um, from zero to point three. The second trapezoid would be from point three to one point seven, and that one has negative um, twenty nine and fifty five. And I could use those in in any order. Um, then the third trapezoid would be one half, and this one's going from two point from one point seven to two point eight. And then if I had fifty five plus negative twenty nine, and again, don't simplify it. Um, that's that's a fine answer. It actually saves you time, saves you from making a silly mistake, and it shows not only the method that you used, but it also shows an answer. Now, it didn't ask for it, but if it did ask for it, this would be in meters because V of T is in meters per hour, so it's on that middle step. So if we um, – if we – integrate it then we go down a step and we become meters any questions on that one all right then i will keep going because now it jumps into a kind of a different question so i think this is what you know i talked about it yesterday when somebody asked me about you know how is that 25 minute question going to be i think it's going to be more like this where they jump around and they and they give you a couple of STEM kind of prompts and then ask you to do different things along those lines. And um, and they're not necessarily connected like an FRQ sometimes is. Um, so this next question, um, you know, you're given, you're given this function um, and it kind of tells you it's two line segments and the quarter of a circle. Um, you wouldn't have to know the, the equation of a circle, but no, you know, that the area of a circle, you know, right out of the gate, I know that I'm probably going to use pi r squared. I mean, I just know that that if, if they're giving me this and I start integrating, I'd have to start talking about area. So I'm going to use that at some point in time. Um, it is known, this was an interesting thing. I actually missed this piece the first time. And, and when I got down to um, part D, I thought, how the heck am I supposed to come up with that in a realistic way? And then I went back up and started reading again and said, oh, that's how I'm supposed to get it. Um, so I knew I – I don't know if anybody else had done that part and was kind of wondering how the heck am I supposed to get f of 3 um, because I, I suddenly was like, well, crap, I can't get that. And then I went back up and read the problem. So that's something that to kind of – clue in on and go, wow, maybe I do need to, maybe they'd give me something that I just skipped over because I completely skipped over it. And then when, at, when I first read it and then I got to that part and I was like, well, how am I supposed to come up with that? I'll show you what I mean in the, in the work that I did. Um, so for part, um, for part C, let's see if I can go down here for part C. It asks me, um, it asks me to find the integral from negative 6 to negative 2. So from negative 6 to negative 2, and I thought this was really interesting. I've never, I've never actually seen a question that 
asked this, that did this before? Because negative six is somewhere over here, right? So negative six is saying, find, you know, if this curve continued, find that space. And, um, and we don't actually have any information on that. What they did give us is they gave us this piece of information. They said from negative six to, to five, the integral was seven. So I know that if I then kind of use some, some intuition here, that if I integrate from negative six to five, which I know that value, I know that that value is seven. If I then take away the integral from negative two to five, I'll be left with the integral from, from negative six to negative two. Does that make sense what I wrote there? Okay, so that's great because right now I know that this is seven. Okay, I know that this, this piece right, right here after the equal sign is seven. Now what I gotta do is I gotta take away a bunch of more area. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to this graph and I'm gonna highlight you know, what I'm gonna, or what I'm gonna add or subtract from this. So if I take this graph here, um, to go from negative two to five, the space that I'm looking at is this space here, and this space here, and that space, and that space, and I'm gonna get a smaller highlighter. Um, and this space right here, I'm actually going to erase some of this here. It's just so I can get it highlighted better for you. This space right here, this space right here. And I really struggle with how, how should I write this out so students aren't confused on my answer key. But and then I'm also going to look at that space right there. So that, that red space right there is the integral from negative 2 to 5 of f of x dx. Does that make sense that that's that space? Okay, so now I can start doing some, some kind of figuring here. And, and notice, that, um, notice that this space and this space amount to zero, right? Half of it's above, half of it's below, it's symmetrical. And this space right here and this space right here amount to zero. So I actually don't even have to calculate any of that space. Um, when I do, when I would you really, have to, like, write it? pardon, would you have to like write it out on the exam? Um, you, you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't be penalized if you did. I mean, I, I did on the answer key, but I didn't have to, okay. I could have just started right from this space and this space. Cause the other, the blue space is, is zero. The green space is actually what my answer is. Okay, the green space is what I actually have to calculate. And so I kind of break the green space into, into two different things. I, I break it into this shape right here, which has an area of two. Okay, it has an area of two. Um, you could find that by doing the trapezoidal rule. You could also find that by just kind of geometrically counting it and kind of going, okay, well, I got this one full box, and then this triangle represents another full box in this grid. So I know that down here, uh, where did I put it? I was down here. I know that down here that this is two plus, now I gotta calculate this other thing here. And that's probably the trickiest part is calculating this other grouping here because what I have is I have this space right here minus this quarter circle. So if I think about like this part right here, that part, that shaded part is really the box minus a fourth of the circle would get me that part. If I geometrically thought about that, you go back to your 
your days of ninth grade geometry, that's a problem that you would have had to do where you wouldn't have had to talk about an integral, but you would have had to find that shaded spot. And you would have said, okay, well, I would find the area of the of the box, and then I'd subtract subtract a quarter of the circle, and I ought to get the that leftover space. And that's exactly how you would go about finding this. And so if I went down here to this spot down here, I would do, okay, the box is nine because it's a three by three. And then if I subtract a fourth of the circle, and I'm not simplifying it, just leaving it there. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to go in and simplify it. I know that I probably could do some simplification in the end. It doesn't matter if you simplify it. That's arithmetic. So don't simplify it. You're running yourself in into a into a um, to only writing something incorrect because you can't get more correct than what I just wrote down. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so let's go back up to this and let's talk about this next piece and evaluating this integral. So um, I didn't do it on the answer key. I didn't separate it out, but I, and, and I don't know that I will either on this one, but um, whenever you have this addition of things right here, that means you can integrate both of those parts individually. So if I were gonna go through and do this part, part D. I'll rewrite the problem, but it was the integral from three to five, two times F prime of X plus four DX. So I know that the two is just a constant that just gets to come along. If I integrate a derivative, they undo each other. So this should just be F of X. If I integrate four, I get 4x, and then I'm going to evaluate it from 3 to 5. So now I am just going to plug in 5 and plug in 3 and then do any calculations that I might have on this. But like if I were writing this out on the exam, I probably would write out, okay, what I have is I have 2 times f of 5 plus 4 times 5 minus 2 times f of 3 plus 4 times 3. Now the only thing that I couldn't leave it this way on the exam, I'm not quite done because I really do need to figure out what is f of 5 and what is f of 3. I can leave everything else. Um, I can leave all this other stuff is, is just arithmetic. So I go, okay, two times F of five. So now I'm going, okay, where am I gonna find F of five? And I go up here, I say, okay, well, F of five, because this is the graph of F, F of five is right there. That's F of five. Um, so I know that F of five is zero. So I know that on my thing down here, I got two times zero. I know that that's zero, but I just wouldn't bother doing that multiplication actually. Um, then I got a two times F of three, and here's where I kind of went, I don't know if anybody else did this, but here's where I went up here and I was like, well, crap, how am I supposed to figure out what that dot is? Honestly, I was like, what am I supposed to do to calculate that Y value? How am I supposed to come up with it and I didn't have to because it's right there. Tells me f of 3 is equal to 3 minus the square root of 5. And so that's all I have to put in there. That's where I'm going to go down here. And I'm just going to write f of 3 is 3, 3 minus the square root of 5. I'm going to do plus 4 times 3, and I am done. I don't have to do anything with that. That's it. Don't bother to simplify it. Really important to, to deal with these parentheses, this one and this one. If you, wanted, if you want to um, 
distribute that negative, that's a fine thing to do if you wanted to do it. But otherwise, you just have to have those parentheses around there. If you didn't have those, then it technically would be wrong and you'd lose some credit for that. Any questions? Um, that? Yep. I thought in the equation it said F prime, though. I'm confused on why you're doing that. Um, it did say F prime, but then because we integrated this derivative, it just turns into F. Okay. Because integrals and derivatives undo each other. Okay. So that's that idea that the second fundamental theorem says that when we when we um, integrated, so the idea of the integral of any derivative is just equal to f. That's that idea. Any other questions? Okay, and then the last part on here says, okay, well now, uh, um, Suppose that g of x is equal to negative 2 to x of f of t. This became, you know, as soon as you, um, as soon as you read increasing or decreasing, you probably ought to think um, the chart, right? I mean, that's, that's where you instantly should think the chart. Now, it's asking for the rate of change of g. It says, is the rate of change of G increasing or decreasing? Well, remember that the rate of change of G, that's really G prime, right? Does that make sense? Because that's G prime. Are we okay with that? So it's asking for the rate of change of G is that, if that's increasing or decreasing. So, you know, if you think of G, G prime and G double prime, when you think about this increasing or decreasing, we determine that if this is positive or negative, right? I mean, so this is what we need to look for. Does that make sense? That if this is what we're being asked, this is what we're being asked, then we're going to look in that portion of it. Does that make sense? Okay, based on your not saying yes or no, then I will say yes, you know. Um, you, you, you know that that's what we're looking for, right? Um, did I skip over something? Yeah, I just went right to, sorry, I'll do E and E and F in a second. I just, I'm sorry, I just jumped right to, I just jumped right to, uh, to G. I'm sorry about that. Are you okay with me continuing on or you want me to back up and go to E? You're good. Okay. I'll go back to E in a second. I, I skipped on that on, on accident. That, that was not intentional. Um, so I'll go back to it. But let me just keep on going with this part G. Okay. Um, and then we'll go back to E and F. So on part G, you're asked to figure out... Um, you're asked to figure out is G increasing or decreasing at X equal one. And so we're going to determine that off of G double prime. So the way I would do that is I'd say, okay, well, G prime of X has to be F of X because of the second fundamental theorem. Then to go further, g double prime of x has to be f prime of x. Remember, we're trying to figure out is g double prime positive or is g double prime negative? So we're looking at is, is, um, is f prime, which is g double prime, of one positive or negative because that's going to be our determination so if we go back up to our graph we go back up to our graph and we look at 
this graph that I'm now going to erase some of the stuff up here because it's it's too cluttered for me. Um, at one right here, this is the graph of F. So F prime, which is equal to G double prime, at that point is equal to two because the slope of that is that line is two. Does that make sense? Okay, so we know we know that F prime of one is equal to two since F prime of one is positive, g double prime of one is also positive, which means g prime is increasing. And that was the question that they asked us. The rate of change, that means the rate of change of g is increasing at x equal 1. Any questions on that portion? And I'll go back to E and F. OK. So let's go back. Sorry, I jumped to, to G. Let's go back to E. So E says, um, you know, you got this function, uh, find the absolute minimum. Um, you, you're, you're going through an absolute minimum on this, on this same function g. So if you think about the absolute minimum, this idea behind it finding an absolute abs maximum. Absolute maximum, sorry. Absolute maximum. The idea behind that is um, step one is, is find the critical numbers. Step two is make a chart, make a table. Step three is calculate y value. And step four is answer the question. Okay, so that's that's how we calculate an absolute minimum or an absolute maximum. Um, different from a relative. With a relative minimum or maximum, we use the chart. An absolute minimum or maximum, you use this, these four steps. And don't deviate from these four steps. The table actually is the justification. If you do those four steps, you will have justified your answer. Okay? So on here, if I go down and I'll write down here for part E, I'm given that g of x was equal to this integral from negative 2 to x of f of t dt. So step one is to calculate any critical numbers. So if I'm going to find the critical numbers for g, I need g prime of x. That's when g prime of x is equal to 0 or undefined. Um, in this case, g prime of x is equal to f of x. And that equals 0 when x equals negative 1 and when x equals 1 half. If you look back up at that graph, that graph, um, I'll scroll up to that graph. That graph here, f, which is also g prime, is equal to 0 right there and right there. So those are our two critical numbers. Um, it also um, it also equals zero out there, so that's a critical number as well. But that critical number is always going to be accounted for when we when we check the endpoints. So the only value, the only x values we have to account for are negative two, negative one, uh, one half, and five. Those are the only values we have to account for in our table. 
So if we start making this table down here, I go, okay, well, I'll make a, I'll make a table then. If, I'm, if that's the next step is I'm going to say, okay, well, I got X, and this is going to be G, which, remember, is the integral from negative 2 to X of F of T dt. And I'm going to use negative 2 because that's an endpoint. I'm going to use negative 1 because that's a critical number. I'm going to use 1 half because that's a critical number. And I'm going to use 5 because that's a critical number. Now, we actually have already done 5 uh, back in part A. We, or part C, we did 5. But I'm not going to scroll up and down to that, to that graph. So if you need to kind of have that graph um, up or you have a picture of that graph, um, then you can you can get it, but um, if you think about like g of negative two, g of negative two is zero because if you go from negative two to negative two, you haven't gone anywhere, and so that's zero. If you go from negative two to negative one, you get a quantity of one half because it's above the x-axis and it's a space of one half. If you go to negative one half. For x, you'd get 1 half uh, minus 1 half minus 1 fourth. Do you need me to go up to the graph and look at that, or are you good with this? Okay. And then if you go to 5, that's the stuff, that's the work that we did already in part C. So we really don't start accumulating anything. So I think it was 3, so it's 2 plus 9 minus that quarter circle. If you look at what that is, um, you know the absolute maximum is when x equals 5, um, it equals 2 plus 9 minus 1 fourth pi times 3 squared. It is really important that you write this. This right there is step 4. Don't just circle a value from your table. Okay? Your table is your justification. Um, that's all four steps. The four steps are I found the critical numbers, I made a table, I calculated the y value, and then I answered the question. So go through all the steps. You go through all those steps, you'll you'll be in in really good shape. Any questions on that? They I can 100 percent guarantee on the test on Tuesday they will ask you for an absolute minimum or an absolute maximum, and that is the way you do it. And if you do it this way, you won't, you, you'll get every point that you deserve if you've, if you've calculated the values correctly. You'll, you'll, you won't miss a single point. You don't have to get cute and start to explain anything. That, that table is your justification. Okay, and then the last part of this problem was kind of a limit one and and as soon as I saw it, I what what you maybe hopefully thought it too, but I thought L'Hopital's rule. It's the first thing I thought it said that oh wow this is gonna be L'Hopital's rule. And then I thought to myself, oh crap if it is, that arc tangent is gonna be a gonna be a, a pain to find the derivative of. So I first need to check if it's L'Hopital's rule. First that that's the first thing I'm gonna do. So um, here's the way I, I did it, okay? So when I did F, I did it like this. When I did F, I said, okay, I got this limit as X goes towards 1 of 10 to the X minus 3 times F prime of X, which remember that's just the slope of that graph, divided by F of X minus the arc tangent of X. And the arc tangent might have scared the crap out of some of you, but um, what I did is I did the following, as I said, okay, if it is L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to get zero over zero. So let me just calculate without writing an equal sign. 
Let me just think about what I'd have. I'd have 10 to the first minus 3 times the derivative of f, which we actually, um, if, we, if we calculate the slope there um, at 1, we would get 2. And instantly I was like, oh, thank God. You know, now I know that 10 to the first minus 6 is not 0. I don't have to worry about L'Hopital's rule because I'm not getting 0 on the numerator. And I'm not getting infinity on the numerator, so I am good. The denominator, I don't know that I want to write equals because if I get 0 on the bottom, um, then my limit doesn't exist. So I'm not going to... I'm not going to write any equal sign yet, um, but now if I look at f of 1, f of 1 actually equals 1, and now I would do this, arc tangent of 1. Now, on the exam, that is an okay answer. You don't have to evaluate the arc tangent of one. In the past, you haven't had to. I did on the on the answer key, but um, but in the past, you haven't you haven't had to. I don't think that that they'll make you. Um, I would be surprised if they made you evaluate it. Um, I know that the arc tangent of one is not one, because um, remember the idea behind the arc tangent of 1 equals something, what that means is that means the tangent of something is equal to 1, and that means that that something is pi over 4. Okay, that's when this, the, the, um, when the adjacent and the opposite sides are the same, and so that's pi over 4. So you could put pi over 4 in there. That's what I did on the answer key. But I, I didn't write that equal sign in there until at the very end when I knew I didn't have an indeterminate form. And f is probably was the hardest, um, hardest portion. Um, I think if it was a L'Hopital's rule question, I don't think they would um, put an arc tangent in there. I think that 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 um, I think that as a if I were gonna if I were writing the exam and I wanted students to know L'Hopital's rule, I would write something that would be easy to take the derivative of because I I want to know whether they know how to take how whether they know to invoke L'Hopital's rule rather than to um, to um, rather than just to evaluate it. But, you know, the more I think about it, that one problem we did earlier this week when we had to use L'Hopital's rule and I found myself typing out L'Hopital's rule, I thought it was a nightmare to type out. And remember I said that it needed to be really formal? I thought that was a nightmare. So I was kind of like, I, I don't know that they'll waste points on that. And what I mean by wasting points on that is there's only a finite number of points that they have to give out. And so I just don't see them giving out points like that and making it be really formal. I could eat my words on that. You know, I would I would keep L'Hopital's rule um, in, in notes next to you um, so you know how to use it and, and refer back to that problem that we did on, um, I don't remember what day that was, maybe that was Wednesday. When, when we did that, I think that was the day we did that one. Um, it could have been Tuesday. Um, but go back to that one and look at what, what I did. I think it might have been Tuesday, actually. Um, so go back to that problem from Tuesday if, you, if you're confused about what, he mean, what, what I mean by doing it formally. Any questions on what I did on that? On that? All right. So... Um, I will post two more problems and I'll make them assignments. I will probably post them. Well, where would be the best place to, I'm trying to think where the best place to post them would be. Um, I can post them in Monday's folder. 
um, in a folder from Monday, but I want I want to be able to explain them on Monday. So I probably will post them in Friday's folder, and I'll probably email you guys and just say that I've posted them, um, and then I will explain them. And I think what I will do is I will set up two office hours, one at probably like 10 o'clock on Monday, um, maybe 10.30 on Monday, and then another one at 1.30 on Monday. I'll record any of them. If, you, if you're like, well, I can't meet, then I'll record any of them. You can watch the explanations um, on those. Certainly 1.30, I'll do one of them. And then, um, and then that should cover you for all the review that AP has asked me to kind of make sure that you know how to do and, um, and all the practice that you would ever need. Does that sound okay? I've been, I've been, um, I've abandoned the idea of doing office hours on Sunday because my wife, um, my wife significantly frowned on a on a Mother's Day calculus office hours. So um, I am I am sorry, but she has she has trumped me on that one and said, "No, I think you're going to spend time with us." And I thought, "Okay, well then I'm not going to do office hours tomorrow." So um, you'll have to live with that. But that's the way it is. And um, and but. If there's if, if it if it if somebody was like wow I could really use more office hours on Monday or or office hours on Tuesday just any last ditch questions that you have I'm happy to do that knowing that you have a test that afternoon is everybody okay with that you can give me just a thumbs up if you if you uh, are okay with that perfect all right that's where we are. Um, thanks for your hard work. I am thoroughly impressed with you guys that come on here and do this stuff and keep on working. Um, I am thoroughly impressed with with your with your work ethic and in doing this stuff. It really, I'm pretty touched by it. So, good job. All right, have a good Saturday. Give yourself, give your mother something nice on Sunday. Thank you, Mr. Alquist. Thank you. you Thanks, Mr. Alquist. Bye, Manny. Um, wait, can I talk to you for a second? You can. Let me 